Online Visa's intelligent immigration platform was designed by immigration attorneys and artificial intelligence developers to create the most successful and efficient process for employment-based green cards. These individuals must meet three of about eight different criteria. And you must not just meet the three, but also prove that you've risen to the top of the profession and get through what is called the Kazarian test to show the totality of the circumstances indicate that you have risen to the top of your profession. The key to this is to understand what is the industry and in what's the niche within the industry and how did the person that is the beneficiary of this case rise to the level. Now, if you think about it, we look at contributions or original contributions first to understand why are you great at what you do. Then we look at the notoriety. That notoriety can come in the form of awards that are national or international, elite memberships, media about you. It can be high pay. It can be judge of the work of others. It can be showcasing that talent. It can be scholarly articles about you. These are the types of criteria that go into proving the EB1-1 green card, and we're glad to take you through those strategies to see if you meet those qualifications or what it would take to do so. The EB1-2 is for outstanding professors or researchers. This visa, unlike the EB1, cannot be self-petitioned. Self-petitioned means the EB1s can be the petitioner for their own cases. They do need to have employment, but they don't need to have an employer sign the documents. The EB1-2 has to have an employer that's either a university, a college, um, or a research facility. The standards are not quite as high to be outstanding as they are to be extraordinary, but it's going to look at things that professors or researchers typically do when they're really good at what they do, and that is published materials, it can be high salary, it can be a number of different criteria that indicate what they do is excellent. We can take you through that strategy to also determine whether or not you meet that. The EB1-3 is for the multinational executive or manager. These are companies that have the correct nexus, meaning that they either are subsidiaries of each other, meaning that one company has a controlling interest in another company, or they are affiliates. And that means that both companies have the same ownership in the same interest levels. So what that means is if you have two owners, they have to have the same equity in both companies. If there are three owners, they do as well. You can't have two owners in one country and another owner in a third country. This is why the subsidiary has a little bit more flexibility than the affiliate, but either one of them can work. Then the position itself has to be for someone who's worked for one of the last three years in a managerial or executive position. You can toll that one year if you're working for the United States operation in another type of visa. Typically it's an L1 visa, but it could also be an H1B or something else also. The EB2, let's deal with the national interest waiver first because it's more similar to the extraordinary ability or exceptional ability. It has some criteria. First, you have to show that you're EB2 and you're either a advanced degree professional or have five years experience or have exceptional ability and you have to meet those criteria. Then you can look at the national interest and there are three things you're gonna look at there. You're gonna look at substantial merit and national impact. Is the job that you've done something that you can control? So are you in a managerial or executive position helping do this thing with your company or a company that helps you to do something in the national interest? And is it substantial? The national impact doesn't really have to be the entire country, but it needs to be of importance. That's a very subjective standard. But what's really cool about the EB2, after a case called the Matter of Donisar, is that it's really become the visa for job creation green cards. So for the startup that may not be extraordinary, but has developed jobs and created those jobs, it's in the national interest to say that person doesn't have to get a labor certification because they would not be able to own a company and get a labor certification. But it's in the national interest that they get a green card because they're creating so many other jobs for Americans. Another one of the EB2s is under the labor certification process. And the EB3 also has the labor certification process. EB2 can be for exceptional ability or it can be for an advanced degree. Let's talk about exceptional ability first. So we talked about that that was the prerequisite of the national interest waiver, that to be exceptional ability or advanced degree. But the exceptional ability is more like the P visa standard for green cards than the O visa standard for green cards, which is the O1 standard. And 
it's just a lower one and it's for entertainment, business, sciences, arts, but what's not listed is athletics. There's been some litigation that says that in fact sports or athletics can be entertainment and that way you can utilize this criteria to help professional athletes. I think in the sports that have television contracts, it'd be tough to do it in an emerging sport, but the televised versions of sports would be able to do this and you'd be able to use a P type standard. Now, if you look at the EB2 uh, exceptional ability standards, they're not like the O1. They're not really set up for sports. You would have to almost put all of it in comparable evidence. Call us and we'll show you how we do that for you. For the standard EB2 and the EB3, there's a concept called the labor certification process. And that's where you have to prove there are no Americans or green card holders willing or able to do the job. In this situation, you have to run these ads after obtaining a prevailing wage to show that you're going to pay the right amount of money for the county and state you're in. But once that, you run these ads in five different manners. You have to run it in the largest newspaper in the metropolitan statistical area on two Sundays. You have to post it in a conspicuous place at the uh, place of employment. You also have to post it on an intranet if the company has that. In addition to that, you have to file with the state workforce agency for 30 days. In addition to that, you have to pick three other types. Those can be things like placing an ad on the company's website, putting one in monster.com. You can do things like radio ads, television ads, job fairs, um, in additional types of newspapers. You can put them in ethnic newspapers. You can put them in trade journals. There's a number of different ways to do that. We help our clients select which ones are best for them. And we actually help develop those ads, get the right types of job titles for the position. It's really interesting. You, there's a tightrope you have to walk when you're looking at the job title for the PERM or labor certification processes. There are three things you need to look at. One's called the SVP. That's the Standard Vocational Preparation. This is a range that the Department of Labor has published is the typical type of job requirements for that type of job. So it might say bachelor's plus two or master's plus two. And if your job ad is more than that, then you have to prove through something called business necessity that it needs more years than that. So for example, if you have a software developer and their SVP says bachelor's plus two and you want them to have a bachelor's plus five because the type of software they're gonna be developing is really complex artificial intelligence or blockchain or something that's gonna deal with multiple billions of dollars flowing through financial technology, you can say we need more than that and here's why. You can also use things such as this is what we typically use when we hire them and have want ads that prove that or look at what the industry typically does and that's getting want ads for other companies. Once you do the labor certification process and you run that ad, if no Americans come forward for the ad, then you can send that to the Department of Labor. After the Department of Labor comes back with an approved labor certification, you can file the I-140 if you have the proof that the beneficiary has those criteria. So it's really important to get job letters verifying that employment at the beginning of the process and not wait till this time to learn that they can't get a letter from a former employer. There's a lot more to go into on this type of visa, but the difference of the EB-2 and the EB-3 is the EB-2 requires advanced degree or exceptional ability. The EB-3 can be a bachelor's degree, but can also have an inexperience level. Of course, those are easier to meet the requirements for, but you can do it without experience. There are also EB-2s or EB-3s for what's called Schedule A. Those can be nurses or physical therapists. They do not need to do the labor certification. They can just go straight into the I-140 after they have obtained the prevailing wage. Um, there's a great need for nurses right now and physical therapists. Contact us if you want to talk more about that. The EB-4 it has the religious visa and some miscellaneous visas. The religious visa has to be for a religious occupation, such as a preacher, minister, rabbi. Can't be for the accountant just because they're working for a church. The EB-5 is the investor visa. The amount of capital that you have to invest in an EB-5 has been increased in the last couple of years. It is now 900,000 for the target employment areas. Those are either rural places that are less than 20,000 people, can't be part of a metropolitan statistical area, has to actually be rural, and the other is in high unemployment areas. 
There are maps that can help you learn that. We know how to read those maps. Contact us if you want to know if you want to go for the lower amount of investment, 900,000, not 1.8 million. There are two types of EB-5s. There's the standalone. We work with companies all the time where we help them invest in their own company. These companies have to employ 10 full-time Americans or green card holders, not including those petitioning for it over a two-year period, by a two-year period and you have to get it approved initially and then at the year and a half you can then apply to have the conditions removed from the green card where you prove again that the money was invested, the jobs were created and the company is still going forward. There is another type of EB-5 for regional centers. These are pre-approved areas, usually massive amounts of jobs. They use an evaluation system to indicate not only the direct jobs like you need under the standalone EB-5, but the indirect jobs. The EB-5 project was to put in a massive facility that maybe did some infrastructure inside a city and it created other jobs like hotels and restaurants and things like that. Then that entire impact could be covered under the evaluation that was done by an evaluation company. This has been a breakdown of our employment-based green cards. To start your visa process, initiate a chat with our ambassadors who are standing by to help you.